Good morning, good morning. I hope everyone had an awesome 4th of July. I know that uh, Mike and I had a little barbecue and it was uh, really enjoyable. We just stayed at home. And uh, our little George Foreman in the garage, we had our barbecue. And I had a steak, she had a turkey burger, and uh, some uh, homemade beans and some uh, coleslaw and some uh, watermelon, uh, some of the traditional stuff, but very enjoyable. So let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, so much for this time to look at your word and to uh, help us to see something new and exciting that we can use in our own lives. I'm again so, so excited, Lord, for your soon return. And, it would, uh, and help us to continue to be ever faithful to, uh, to the overall mission of uh, spreading the gospel. And we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so Genesis 25, uh, continuing, I'll uh, we'll do verses 12 through 18 today. <clears throat> as I promised yesterday, uh, this is going to be uh, rather interesting. As we take a look at some of these uh, other children that are not in the uh, direct line going all the way to Christ. Uh, so we're going to talk about Ishmael today and how uh, the, uh, the basic beliefs of the Muslim flay, uh, faith came out of this part of Abraham's uh, <coughs> concubine's uh, son, <coughs> who was not uh, in God's plan originally, but he did honor the fact that he was of Ishmael's blood uh, out of Ishmael's loins, as he has put, and that he's going to give him an inheritance, but it's going to be, we're going to find out that it's going to be heading in a direction that becomes almost in direct uh, confrontation with the uh, Hebrew nation. So as we stated yesterday, Ishmael did become a large nation, and that's why most Arabs look to Abraham through Ishmael uh, as their heritage. The Ishmaelites settled in northern Saudi Arabia, and let me get our map back up here. I don't know if I've shown you this map before. This is the, actually a little bit cleaner one I found. So I, I'm using it instead of the one uh, I had before. I don't know if I showed you this one yet or not. But let me get... Uh, there we go. So again, uh, Abraham's over here in Hebron. And I just realized that uh, I have the wrong slide because you can't see my cursor. Let's try this again. I'm suggest that. How come I can't see the cursor? It's weird. Okay, there it is. Let me make it bigger. So, we got uh, Abraham is over here in Hebron. And uh, as we talked about yesterday, uh, that they sent off both uh, Hagar's and Keturah's uh, with, their, with their sons off uh, with their sons off into uh, the east. So the east is being over here. And this basic northern part is where most of Ishmael's uh, descendants uh, settled. That also it went uh, even went further south down through, uh, as we talked about before, down into the uh, north, southern part. Also, as they spread out uh, over the years, because they end up uh, this area of Medina uh, is a, uh, we've got two separate things happening too. Uh, that we're going to talk about even more as we go through the rest of this chapter. We've got Ishmael uh, and we got the sons of uh, Katera, which end up also having a genealogy. And, uh, and then even going further, uh, we'll be talking about the, uh, uh, we get to Jacob we start talking about Esau, and he also is a part of this uh, this other part of the root of Deb, uh, but he's actually a son of Isaac. So that, uh, it's a different period, 
uh, but it's additional, additionally more people in this area. So you really have three sets of people that uh, ultimately come out of Abraham's uh, loins. So we got. Uh, so we're talking about the Ishmaelites today. We're also going to find out. We're going to be also talking about the Moabites, and we're also going to be talking about the Arabs in general. Uh, so continuing here, let's get some verses. So now these uh, now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, who Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael is uh, Nebajoth and Kedar and Abiel and uh, Mipsum. If you look on this chart, you'll be able to find all these different names. We did this a couple of times already, so I won't do it again. And Mishma and Duma and uh, Massa. Hadar and Tima, Jitor, uh, Napish and uh, Kidama. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns and by their castles. Twelve princes according to the nations. So I, I know we had talked about this already yesterday. Uh, or sometime in the past. I remember just talking about this. <laughs> but I really want to concentrate today is how this ended up uh, turning into the uh, Muslim, uh, the uh, uh, Islamic religion. And if you really uh, think about it, that uh, when it comes to see, uh, I might also mention that uh, I mentioned the northern part of Saudi Arabia and now occupy most of the current day Saudi Arabia, along with most of the Middle East, uh, different traditions. Uh, but what happened after this, and we will briefly look at a couple, since it shows how the Muslim world sees Ishmael as a God-given heir. Uh, not Isaac. Uh, so if you were to talk to the average Muslim, they would think that the, uh, the actual uh, promises of God that Abraham got actually were given to Ishmael, not to, uh, not to Jacob. I mean, not to uh, Isaac. <clears throat> so, that, so I'm going to kind of show you what they believe today. So the, Jew so the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions consider Ishmael to be the ancestor of the Ishmaelites or the Hagarines, or the Arabians. <clears throat> and the patriarch of uh, Qadar, according to Muslim tradition, in which he is regarded as an ancestor of Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad, uh, those who are not familiar, is considered to be like the, almost like the Jesus Christ of the Muslim religion. Uh, that, uh, that he's going to return someday uh, and, uh, and finish uh, the kingdom. Uh, it has to do with the, uh, they call it the Ahmadi. Uh, and when he returns, he's going to make everything right and that we're all going to become slaves to the Muslims. Uh, that's, that's a really brief, uh, what they believe. They actually believe in Jesus Christ, but only as a prophet and that he's actually going to uh, bow down to Mohammed uh, or the, uh, the, uh, to their savior. So Ishmael, therefore, founded a great nation as promised by God in the Old Testament and was buried with his mother, Hagar, uh, next to the Kaaba in Mecca. Now, this is the famous place that uh, you hear lots about. Uh, it's this here. This is the Kaaba. It's in Mecca, uh, which is uh, down here in Medina. I'm sorry. No, right here in Mecca. And it's the most holiest site in the Islam religion. Whenever you see the, uh, whenever you see somebody uh, from the Muslims praying, and they pray five times a day. Uh, they have their set times they have to pray, and they have a certain uh, way they have to do it. They usually kneel on a, a, on this cloth, and they face Mecca. They actually face here, so that uh, at any given time a Muslim knows where how to face themselves to to face Mecca. So as you can see here. Uh, and that uh, one of their one of their conditions in their religion is that at some time in their life they need to try to do a uh, uh, come to the actual country uh, and actually uh, worship right here in front of this. Uh, so that's why you see all these people around. 
so it says that uh, him and his mother were buried uh, next to next to this. So that is this little uh, circle similar area here is where supposedly that uh, uh, Ishmael and her mother and his mother are buried. And the Kaaba considered the most holy spot, uh, spot of Islam is where a Muslim prays face and facing it five times a day. The Quran, the Quran is their Bible. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's quite the book. I've actually read parts parts of it, and uh, and even there's even parts of the Quran that uh, that uh, you'll see Abraham in there. And you'll even see uh, references to Jesus, but only as a uh, prophet. Uh, And the Quran contains several verses regarding the origin of the Kaaba. Uh, it states that the Kaaba was the first house of worship for mankind, and that it was built by Abraham and Ishmael on Allah's instruction. Allah is who they call their God. Uh, he is actually a God that, if you really research it, uh, he was called the moon god of many gods that came out of the Babylonian Empire uh, period of time. Uh, but that, uh, they, they see Allah as the, uh, the main, the, the head God. And so that's who they worship to. And, uh, and the uh, Quran was actually written by uh, Muhammad as being a vision supposedly that he got from uh, Allah. And so that uh, according to their traditions, the Abraham, and they spell it with an I, I-B-R-A-H-I-M, and Ishmael, uh, they spell it slightly different too, I-S-M-A-I-L, and uh, supposedly built the original one of these. The original one of these was destroyed in a flood. I wonder who caused the flood. So while Abraham was building the Kaaba, an angel brought to him the black stone, which he placed in the eastern corner of the structure. Uh, I did have a picture of it, but it's in one of these uh, corners. Uh, they actually have a port you can look in and actually see the rock like through this window. She placed in the eastern corner of the structure. Another stone was the uh, Makuim uh, Ibrahim, the station of Abraham, where Abraham stood for elevation while building the structure. The black stone in uh, Makim uh, Abraham are believed by Muslims to be the only remnant of the original structure made by Abraham as the remaining structure had to be demolished and rebuilt several times over history for its maintenance. Uh, after the construction was complete, God enjoined the descendants of Ishmael to perform an annual privilege called the, ha, the Hajj and the Kurban, sacrifice of cattle. The vicinity of the shrine was also made a sanctuary where bloodshed and war were forbidden. So that, uh, in fact, uh, within this structure, even if there's a reason to, they, they, they will not hurt somebody inside here. Some of the things about Which, of course, all of this is only legend, and we know false due to what the Bible says. But it's the main reason the Muslims want Judaism and Christianity eliminated. And according to the Quran, uh, the only true religion, which with with all the others to be eliminated or converted. So we as Americans are known as the big Satan, and Israel is called the little Satan. Uh, so that, uh, ultimately, the and peaceful Muslims probably won't say anything uh, to us uh, directly. Uh, but there are the radical. There's two there's two different sides of the Muslim religion. I wasn't going to get deep into the study on that, uh, but there's uh, two different uh, sects, and one is more warlike, and the other one is more peaceful. Uh, so there is. So you may uh, you may know plenty of Muslims that uh, are very peace loving people, very family oriented, uh, good people, nothing wrong with them, and they just uh, believe in their religion. Just like some other religions believe in. Let's look at so let's get back to the truth of the Bible. And so I guess this brief little thing about uh, uh, so we'll go back to this map. So anyway, so basically after this point. Then you're reading here. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. Uh, just before this period of time, I, I didn't finish uh, one more paragraph here. Uh, that uh, I mentioned that when uh, 
Abraham had sent them out from Hebron, uh, that they actually wandered for uh, in the wilderness for some time. Ishmael and his mother settled in the desert of Paran. This is the desert Paran, right over here, is where they settled. We see this over in Genesis 21, 20 through 21. We'll get that in a second. Let me finish reading this part here. And they dwelt from Hebar unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest towards Assyria. And he died in the presence of his brethren. So they basically lived over in this general area over here, because uh, over here is Egypt. And so they just basically went south. <laughs> and then also uh, in Genesis 21, when we get to that, uh, going back a little bit. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. This is talking about Ishmael. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. His mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Uh, so ultimately he married, uh, Ishmael did, and, uh, had all, uh, and had all these kids. Where he became an expert in archery. Eventually his mother found him a wife from the land of Egypt. They had 12 sons, each of whom became a tribal chief in one of the regions from Haviar to Shore. So that's his whole general area. There's Havila, and I don't see shore on this particular map. No, I think it. I think it has to do with this area over here near Paran, but it might be someplace even south. Anyways, this is general area. I don't see the word shore anywhere in here, but. Uh, S-H-U-R. But basically it's the area of, uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. The other name for it is Midian. Midian is right here. And so uh, uh, there was a total of 12 sons, but a couple of them are actually very uh, interesting. And we're going to look at, take a look at them. And they were the, uh, he was the father of the Ishmaelites. They're also known as the Mennonites, and that's where you see this word here. Uh, and so we see that referenced over in Judges 8, 22 through 24. And the men of Israel said unto Gibeon, Roll thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of the Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earring of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Uh, so a little tie in there kind of shows that the word Ishmaelites and Midian are tied together. Also in Genesis 37, 25 to 38. And they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gideon I mean, Gilead, with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? This is the case we're going to get to when we talk about Joseph and how he was sold to the Ishmaelites uh, going into Egypt. Come and let us sell him into the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. We'll talk a lot about that when we get to Joseph. Uh, Joseph's uh, brothers get really mad with him, and they and they uh, and they want to th first they want to kill him. Then one of the brothers convinces <coughs> not to do that and to throw him into a pit. And then they think better on that, and they decide to sell him into slavery, which is actually all in God's plan. Beautiful story. We'll, we'll be studying now when we get to chapter 37. I'm just showing here the tie-in with the Ish Ishmaelites. And also jumping down to verse 36. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt under Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Uh, so you see those two names are kind of uh, uh, interchanged. Just one more in Genesis 39.1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, Captain of the guard and an Egyptian brought him of the uh, him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had been brought him down thither. 
So you can see that the name is used both uh, for uh, both uh, both ways. That's all I was trying to prove there. Now Mount Sinai was in Shur, and Mount Sinai, a lot of controversy over Mount Sinai because that's where uh, when we get to if we ever get the uh, Exodus and we start talking about Moses. Uh, Mount Sinai is traditionally uh, in one place. But I really lean towards where some people have discovered this mountain is actually right here. Uh, we have something I can point with there. I didn't stay with the pointer. That's interesting. Anyways, I'll use my thumb. Uh, right at the end of my thumb is an area that I believe is where Mount Sinai is the real one. There's another, uh, most of the traditional site for it is where the end of my thumb is now, right down in here. Uh, there's been a lot of history, a lot of uh, proof going on, and it makes more sense for it to be over here based on some of this uh, stuff here we're talking about. And the fact that uh, Moses ends up marrying a, a woman uh, whose uh, father was the priest of Midian. And this is where Midian is, is over here, not over there. So that's why uh, I have uh, I lean towards this location up here, just about at the bottom of that P on Peran. And over in Numbers 11.34, uh, it talks about this. And he, and he called the name of the place uh, Kibber Hethavai, because they, there they buried the people that uh, lusted. <clears throat> And in combination with Exodus 15, 22 is where this, uh, those two verses together. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Uh, and the Red Sea, uh, you see, some of the older maps didn't have two of these spokes off of them. I need a different map. A different map. Okay. So the Red Sea, okay. You see how there's two spokes here. Well, a lot of that in uh, the place we were talking about before. But right there, uh, this is the traditional site of where Mount Sinai is. But I really lean towards uh, this, uh, where that dot is and that X is, is right about here. And some of the original maps showed only this spoke. And so when they talked about crossing the Red Sea, because uh, they realized they were up in here, they're talking about this part here, where I can I can see the case for them actually crossing over here. And when they start to, and there's some investigation work being done over there, that, uh, uh, I'll go that even more. Oh, this thing loves to. The crossing over here is actually a land bridge in the water over here. And it makes a lot of sense for them when they crossed over in the famous uh, Red Sea crossing was actually over here, not over here. And it's based a little bit on some of these verses. A uh, little side note there of interest.
In the book of Galatians, I'm going to read through it. Paul uses this incident to symbolize the two covenants, the old but fulfilled and new covenant, which is universal by promise through Jesus Christ. Uh, so let's take a look at that. I think that's a great example. So starting in Galatians verse 4.22, chapter 4, verse 22, we'll be reading pretty much right through through 31. For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. That was, he thought he was doing God a favor. He was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, uh, for these things are two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, uh, which uh, gendereth to bondage, which is air. But the one with Agar, Agar meaning Hagar. And for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So basically the old covenant, meaning that uh, through the flesh, uh, through the law, uh, through works, uh, is how they were able to uh, satisfy the Lord at that time. And this is a comparison. And here's right in Galatians, Paul is explaining it. So it's not even my speculation. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, uh, which is the mother of us all. Which, that would be the descendant, Jerusalem being the, uh, the uh, capital of the descendants of the people coming from Ishmael. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that uh, travailest not. For the desolate have many more children than she which had a husband. In this case, what it's trying to say is that the husband in this case is the marriage of God and the and his people. Uh, versus uh, what he's talking about there, the uh, rejoice that thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou travailest not. For the desolate have many more children. Uh, so that uh, uh, that's talking about the flesh uh, and or here we're talking about Ishmael, which is the, uh, the uh, fleshly side of this covenant. Now we brethren, as Isaac was our, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so is it now. And even so, even, uh, even nowadays it still is. And that's this whole battle that's going on between uh, the Arabs and the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Gaza Strip and uh, the, uh, all the rockets going back and forth. This is an age old that's why somebody once said that uh, they try to blame U.S. presidents for different reasons why there's so much turmoil in the Middle East. And it just makes me laugh. Uh, America is only 250 years old. Uh, this feud has been going on since 2000 B.C. Well, actually, no, not quite that far. But, uh, where we are right now, about uh, well, pretty close to 2000 B.C. So nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman uh, and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That's what just happened with Abraham. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And so uh, I like that, uh, how Paul kind of shows us that uh, allegory of the comparison of Ishmael to, uh, to Isaac. <clears throat> So again, uh, as a review, I, Hagar is associated with the Sinai covenant, which is of the law, while Sarah is associated with the covenant of grace into which her son Isaac enters. Uh, some Christians, not I, and it's the first time I heard this actually, believe that God fulfills his promises to Ishmael today by blessing the Ishmaelites with oil and political strength. Uh, that somehow he's honoring Ishmael uh, in the fact that they're, they're very rich countries, but I uh, it doesn't sound like the uh, something God would necessarily do. <clears throat> but if you ever heard that before, you might hear that at some point. Just some other verses about Arabia uh, over in Ezekiel 27, 21. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, and they occupied with the Three in lambs and goats, uh, rams and goats, and these were thy uh, merchants. Uh, that's the other big thing is that they became nomads. They were big on merchants going back to this area. They were all pretty much nomads. Uh, they, tra they traveled uh, quite a bit and selling their goods from one place to another. 
that's why we heard him mention, uh, even when we get to Joseph, because they, uh, they sold him to a, a caravan heading uh, from this general area down into Egypt to sell their wares. Also, Isaiah talks about it in uh, chapter 21, 13 through uh, 16. The burden upon Arabia and the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of uh, Dedanim. The inhabitants of the land of Tema brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevent with the, their bread him that fled. Tema is one of the, right here, it's one of the areas that uh, is one of the descendants of Ishmael. For they fled with the swords from the dawn sword and from the bent bow and from the grievousness of war. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, within a year, according to the years of a hireling, and all the glory of Kedar shall fail. Again, this whole area is considered Kedar. I showed you on that other map once. <clears throat> and the residue of the number of archers and the mighty men of the children of Kedar shall be diminished, for the Lord God of Israel has spoken it. So these are all prophecies of what's going to ultimately happen to them. Uh, but that, uh, they are definitely still in, uh, in, in play today. And one of the little side notes, uh, talking about uh, uh, there is some, uh, this Nabot, actually Nabot, yeah, Nabioth, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe the father of the Nabataeans of the area known as Petra, and that's based on Josephus. Uh, Josephus wrote that in his historical guide. Josephus was a historian of the first century, and it's, uh, I'm actually reading his book right now, uh, Antiquities of the Jews. I find it fascinating to just get it from a point of view of somebody who lived in that time frame. And uh, it's mostly Old Testament that he talks about. Uh, he didn't believe in the Messiah, it doesn't appear, even though he was writing during that same time frame. Uh, but that, uh, uh, it's very interesting to read his stuff in comparison to what the Bible says, uh, just to get a, a different frame of reference of what people thought about back then. <clears throat> The Jewish historian uh, of the Roman era uh, made this comment about it. When the lad was grown up, he married a wife by birth and an Egyptian from whence the mother was herself derived originally. Of the wife were born to Ishmael 12 sons, and he listed all the same sons. These inhabited all the country from Euphrates to the Red Sea and called it a uh, Nabatine. Uh, they are the Arabian nation and named their tribes from these both because of their own virtue because of the dignity of Abraham, their father. Uh, you can see that in his book called The Jewish Antiquities, uh, chapter one, uh, actually book one, chapter 12, uh, fourth, fourth chapter, fourth uh, paragraph. Here's some other definitions. Uh, Kedar. Kedar was the father of the uh, Kedarites, a northern Arabs tribe that controlled the area between the Persian Gulf and the Sinai Peninsula. So the Persian Gulf, I'll go back to the other map. This is the Sinai Peninsula, and this is the Persian Gulf. According to tradition, he is the ancestor of the Kurish tribe and, and thus ancestor of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. And uh, Ishmael also had one known daughter, uh, Mehalath was her name, or uh, Basemoth. The third, and she became the third wife of Esau. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit when we get into uh, Jacob. Probably uh, later this week or early next week. But we'll see that over in uh, Genesis. Twenty-eight, eight through nine, and thirty-six, two through three. For some reason I decided not to put it in here. Just, uh, I just mention it. So to finish off this chapter, all right, oh, these are the verses I already mentioned on the last page. Arabia, I did put them in here. Genesis, why did I put these here? 2120.
Oh, I'm not sure why I put them in there. All right, those are the ones I, oh, they were repeated from before. Okay, so just finishing up this section. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, this is before Egypt, and there goest toward Assyria, and he died in the presence of his brethren. I think I already read that somewhere. Anyway. I think I hit everything I want to hit today. Uh, oh, just a little comment on verse 17. It says, Ishmael appeared with Isaac at the burial of Abraham. Ishmael died at the age of 137. Uh, and it, uh, uh, that Isaac... Uh, that uh, both Isaac and Ishmael uh, had uh, buried Abraham. Not sure why I put that there. That was the last time I guess that Ishmael and Isaac actually were together. That's what I was trying to point out. Oh, in Isaiah 60, verse 7. Also mentions Kedar and Naboth. And the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, and the rams of Naboth shall minister unto thee. And thou shalt come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the horse, house of my glory. Uh, so this kind of shows a tie uh, between this area known uh, that we'll talk about when we get into uh, the uh, uh, the whole thing with uh, the Moabites and uh, Esau. And so... Uh, because that general area of uh, the Moabites settled in the area I'm talking about, uh, that if you were to visit there, it's called Petra, and I think I showed you the pictures. And that was supposedly the kingdom of the uh, Nabataeans. That's why I was saying some people believe the Nabataeans and this and this son uh, of Naboth are were <coughs> were this one and the same person, just a slight different spelling of the name. Okay, so that's all I have for today. And let's end with a prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, so much for helping us to, with this lesson and to uh, continue to help us to understand your word and to see the history behind uh, even the things that we see going on today, that we see the backstory on some of this and why that uh, all these things are kind of coming to fruition now. We give you praise and thanks, Lord. Uh, may we have a safe uh, day and that we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk again tomorrow. We love you. And we thank you so much for all you do. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And we'll hit on another uh, lesson. Heading into uh, continuing here in Genesis 25. So have a great day.